Chapter 8, Return of the Metal. Content warning, discussion of the Holocaust. IBM had set up a number of subsidiaries across Europe, including in France, Italy, and Sweden, even before Hitler came to power. But by the late 30s, when it became clear that Nazi Germany was about to launch a war, several countries that previously had not invested in IBM's Hollerit machines suddenly made a scramble to. Clearly, the German army had benefited from this technology, and it was time to get organized. So in Poland, for instance, IBM launched a subsidiary called Watson Business Machines weeks before the Nazis invaded. After the invasion, this subsidiary was used to manage the looting and subjugation of the Polish people. Holland, too, invested in Hollerit machines in early 1940, and IBM had been planning to set up a new subsidiary there mere weeks before the Nazi conquered that country, too. When, a month after taking Holland, the Nazis began their invasion in France, one thing became abundantly clear. Watson's medal from Hitler was a really bad look. Only, or as much as, 2% of the US population thought Germany was justified in its invasions of neighboring countries. Anti-Nazi sentiment was widespread at the time. Even worse for Watson, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI started investigating IBM for its Nazi connections. Watson was in a tight spot and knew what had to be done. He had to call his friends over at the State Department to ask whether they could maybe please request that he return the medal so that he could maintain plausible deniability towards the Nazis. The Secretary of State responded with a kindly worded letter saying that they would not be doing that and that he would have to make that call by himself. So finally, for lack of other options, Watson did return that medal to Hitler and quite publicly, writing, and I'm paraphrasing here, what happened to world peace through world trade, sad face emoji. The Nazis lost their shit, right? Particularly Heidinger, the Nazi running Dehomag. German media threw a fit. The act was read as an exceptional insult to the Fuhrer and, by extension, the German people. Such was the propaganda. In IBM offices all over Germany and German-occupied territory, Watson's picture was taken down from the wall. <laughs> Um, furthermore, from one day to the next, IBM's majority holding of Dehomag became widely known. Heidinger, more than ever, wanted Watson out, and initially thought that this was a great opportunity to do just that. He offered Watson an ultimatum. Either IBM would surrender their shares to Dehomag, or Heidinger would sell his shares to them, thus rendering it impossible for them to do business with the Third Reich. Watson, however, understood something that Heidinger, as well as most Nazi officials, would only grudgingly come to terms with over several months. They were still dependent on IBM. To produce the needed machines, the spare parts, the punch cards, etc., and to do so in so swift a manner that all of these Hollerit-dependent projects could transition without drastically delaying operations was nothing short of an impossibility. Remember, punch card administration was being used for the censuses in Germany and German-occupied territory, organizing conscripted and enslaved workers, by 1940, these numbered two and a half million people. Censuses for horses and livestock, 
keeping records of plundered goods, vehicles, raw materials, keeping records of all battles and damages sustained. And the list just goes on and on. Punch cards were consumed by the Nazis in the billions. So think of it. Watson, had he agreed to either of these options, sell his shares or buy out Tehomag, could have totally upended German administration in one fell swoop. All he would have had to do was give in to these demands that they were making. But as his legal counsel would advise him, it would be much more profitable to hold on to Dehomag, let the Nazis come to terms with their dependence on IBM, and in the event that the US should enter the war, simply let their operations be seized. You see, because unlike Poland or Yugoslavia or Romania or other Eastern countries that Hitler had every intention of conquering, the US as, or, and Britain were seen more as equal adversaries because racism. They would not be conquered. They would only be defeated. Watson knew that whatever the outcome of the war, the Germans would manage his business conscientiously and would pay the profits generated during the company's seizure during wartime. On top of the profits that he was guaranteed in that case, he would also have plausible deniability towards the US government, since he could believably claim that IBM would not know what the machines were being used for. So from the first census, under Hitler in 1933 until the summer of 1940, Dehomag had been micromanaged by Watson. After August of 1940, the new policy was not to ask what the machines were being used for. In 1941, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US entered the war. Following this, just as IBM had planned for, Dehomag, as well as IBM operations in all of Nazi-controlled Europe, were seized and managed directly by high-ranking Nazi party members. Watson was in the clear. So, what were the machines used for? There were Hollerit machines in every concentration camp, pretty much. Concentration camps were either transit zones, crowding prisoners together to wait for a transfer, or slave labor factories, or they were extermination sites. Some camps, like Auschwitz, combined elements of all three. Camps all had these three digit codes. Auschwitz was 001. A person arriving at a camp would be cross-indexed with political indices to confirm whether they would be subject to special cruelty. Based on the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, prisoners would be classified along 16 categories. Political prisoner, one. Jehovah's Witness, two. Homosexual, three. Dishonorable military discharge, four. Clergy, five. Communist Spaniard, six. Foreign civil worker, seven. Jew, eight. Asocial, nine. Habitual criminal, 10. Major felons, 11. Gypsy, 12. Prisoner of war, 13. Covert prisoner, 14. Hard labor detainee, 15. Diplomatic consul, 16. Prisoners were forced to wear emblems designating the category. For example, pink triangles for homosexuals, two triangles forming a Star of David for Jews. Depending on the assigned category, they will be treated accordingly, with different forms of torture being prescribed to different categories. None suffered more than the imprisoned Jewish population. 
Hollerith coded numbers were assigned to each prisoner. In Auschwitz, these numbers would be tattooed on their chest and later on on their arms because those were easier to access in a pile of corpses. On a side note, the tattooed numbers eventually developed away from Hollerith numbers and in fact became very incongruous. Daily strength and injury reports were recorded on punch cards. These would be sent to punch card processing offices in Berlin, from where the extermination by labor and the distribution of slave labor was managed centrally. Who could still work? Who would be murdered? Who would be transferred to another camp? The cause of death would also be recorded on punch cards. These would mostly be falsely recorded as natural causes. Natural causes could include being forced to jump off a cliff, gas chambers, shooting, or being hoisted by their arms behind their back until dying under excruciating pain. Beginning with the 1933 census, through the Nuremberg laws and further censuses, the punch card machine had gone on to process extermination in detail. I won't go into more detail than I already have. There are plenty of resources if you want to learn more about the Holocaust. If you're very unfamiliar with this topic, um, the graphic novel Mouse might be a good place to start, which is a book that is not banned in most places. And once again, I'd encourage you to check out the work that these chapters are based on, IBM and the Holocaust, by Edwin Black. We're not quite done yet with this story, though. But next week, you're getting the story that's going to make this entire bleak saga worth it. And that's a promise. Go in peace. And speaking of peace, may the warmongers of this world choke on fucking pretzels or spontaneously combust. Solidarity to my brothers and sisters in Ukraine, Yemen, Palestine, and solidarity to those brave Russians who are out protesting for peace. See you next week.